Rich Perez here in Las Vegas, Nevada, of course, the greatest city in the world. And I, I truly believe this. And Dr. Joshua Colbreth is sitting in front of me, one of the greatest men that I have ever, ever been associated with. And in 1956, he was at his top peak form, tearing it up in the Olympic Games. And he also won many, I mean, many, many races in the 400 uh, meter hurdles. So, Dr. Josh, people have seen you on TV. They've seen you in athletics over the years. Uh, of course, you, you're well known for the Cosby Show as well. When you were a kid, what made you want to get into track and field? Well, it wasn't a case of what. When we were children, we didn't have any facilities like uh, recreation centers or anything. And uh, I grew up in a little block there with the international block in Norristown, Pennsylvania, 18 miles west of Philadelphia. Six doors from me, of course, was Tommy Lasorda. And we didn't know he was going to be the Tommy Lasorda. Around the corner was uh, Jimmy Smith, the number one progressive jazz organist in the world, according to Motown, for maybe 50 years. We didn't know he was going to be the Jimmy Smith. But here, in this little town, uh, we learned to do things under the street lights. Across the street from us was a, a little school called Holy Savior School Playground. We had a dirt pavement um, over there where we learned to shoot marbles, all of us, and we had contests going because they hadn't paved the, it, and that was a great thing to us, it was a gift. So we learned how to humor ourselves. We could take a, ba um, a basket, a 5-8 basket that you'd uh, put peaches in, and we could tack it up to a telephone pole, and we had a basketball game with a tennis ball. Well, we improvised. If someone had a baseball, we'd beat it to death. The baseball began to look like it was a little rubber golf ball, which we'd take then, find some black electrical tape, tape it up and beat on it some more. And we had fun, we had fields to go into, Blue Mill Field, and boy, that was a haven for us. So we improvised and we had races under the street lights. We did everything on the street lights. We played ball in the streets as much as we can, but if we can get over and play in Holy Savior's fence, we would. If not, we had to go down to Blue Mill Field and try again. But I never knew what I wanted to be rich, and I never dreamed about becoming the athlete that I did. I guess that was the same thing with most athletes, Tommy in particular, but there was a thing called um, having exposure and having that determination. And I think those were the gifts that we were giving, that if we were given an opportunity, we will. And those words were to play a major role in my life because I based my life on a word called kismet, K-I-S-M-E-T. And that, to me, is truly one of the greatest words for dealing. It is uh, preordained. It is um, something that uh, you uh, couldn't stop happening. It was inevitable. So with that, I uh, really surround my life. I learned this when I had competed in India years ago and then later was asked by the central government of India to come back and to work with them and coach which I did, and from there I learned quite a bit. Well, I learned as an athlete that if you wanted to be someone, you had to train hard. You had to make a lot of sacrifices. I read, like, like many people, about the great Jesse Owens. I read about Joe Lewis. I read about all these great black athletes. We had colored athletes, as we called them in those days, and they began to be an inspiration to me. Well, we had white athletes that we admired too because they were the our heroes just like our own. But here we had to try and emulate them somehow. Then when you have to, when you can prove that you can run a little faster than most people, it's a God gift. I was a slow, say, in maturing. I, um, I was a, a, a short individual and therefore the coaches didn't want to give me a fair opportunity to play basketball, to play football, and um, I began to show some promise. I taught myself how to run the hurdles when I was uh, in about uh, the seventh or eighth grade. And uh, I did well, and I taught myself how to pole vault, which I used the bamboo pole, which we used to use for the high jump bar, and also to use for pole vault, uh, say, stick to clear heights. And uh, that was one of the ways in which we improvised. But with all of this, when I got to high school, 
I didn't run my in my uh, tenth grade my first year because the coach wanted me to be uh, a uh, a pole bowler, which I had won a championship, and I wanted to be a hurdler, so I didn't run. So I ran the second and third year. The second year I was runner up in the in the state meet in the 200 meter hurdles, uh, 200 yard hurdles rather. And then the next year I won the state, and my time was the second best in the country. There's only one boy, I believe his name was Baptiste from Texas, that ran a few tenths second best than I did. But here I was, not knowing what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do. I found out I had scholarships, and so I took an advantage of going to Morgan State, which was a historical black school with less than a thousand students. I think the ratio was like about oh, 600 uh, women and 300 men or something like that at the time. But, at any rate, I had a great coach by the name of Eddie Beaver. He saw something in me a lot of coaches didn't see. And uh, when uh, he turned me loose to try those 400 meter hurdles, I found a race that I thought was me because the high hurdles were three feet six and came off halfway over my body being five feet seven. And uh, the low hurdles were not in the Olympic Games. They were two feet six. The intermediate hurdles were six inches lower than the high hurdles and six inches higher than the, than the low hurdles. So that one became my race, but it was a quarter mile. I had to think about, do I really want to run a quarter mile with 10 hurdles, three feet high? Well, the first time I ran them in a race, believe it or not, was in the famous Penn Relays in Philadelphia, at the University of Pennsylvania, which was on my home city. I was born 18 miles outside of that city. That's the first time I ran the hurdles, and I got third, and I was astounded. I liked what I did. The rest is history. Because after that, I came back to the Penn Relays from Morgan State College, and I won that race three consecutive years. And from there, I went on to win the American Championship three consecutive years. From there, I won the Pan American Games title for two consecutive Pan Am Games. All of these were in record time. And from there, it was history because on to the Olympic Games and later on to run many, many records in just about every country I ran into. I was never beaten by a European runner. I never was beaten by a runner from South America, from the continent I'm using. I never was beaten by anyone from Asia. I was beat by one man in Africa. His name was Rotatus Patgir. He was the only man from the continent of Africa that whipped me. I was never whipped by any other partner in the world during my career. The only ones who defeated me were my teammates from the United States. So I can say with a great deal of pride, again, from the continents of Europe, I was never defeated, Asia, South America, and Australia. Wow. So that it was truly a tribute, I thought, to many things. And I want to ask you about the Olympics. We're going to do that on another tape here, Duck. But uh, truly, truly, an amazing athlete, Dr. Joshua Culbreth. And it's a true honor to call you one of my best friends. Thanks. My pleasure indeed, Grace. Thank you.